Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers today. We have, uh, I'll give a, a brief introduction, we'll give a little bit of background on Olefin's production for those who are not familiar with this area. We have some questions that we've written out, um, and but we also have an, a time for some open discussion. And you're welcome at any time during the questions. If another question comes to your mind, you're welcome to ask that question either uh, via your microphone or in the chat window. And I'll just, um, I'll be the moderator, so I'll go ahead and uh, select some of those questions. If you'd just like to, to chime in and, and discuss, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, then we'll have some concluding remarks. The one thing um, that I'll just ask you to do, if you're not asking a question, just go ahead and mute your microphone to the right of your name. Um, and uh, that will just help to keep some of the feedback uh, audio issues under control. Okay, so um, first of all, we have on our panel, we have Mark Darby. He's an uh, uh, independent uh, consultant, uh, has a CMID solutions company. He's worked at Aspen Tech and Setpoint, a PhD from the University of Houston with Professor Nicola, and he has uh, 33 years of, of application experience in, in the ethylene plants and refineries gas plants. And one of the distinguishing things about Mark and his research is he's investigating better ways to do the step response uh, models and generate uh, the linear MPC models that go into the advanced process control solution. So Mark has a number of innovative techniques that he's developing and has developed in this area. So Mark, do you want to say anything else about your background? Oh, I think you've got it, John. Thank you. Okay, great. We also have Doug Nicholson, uh, Apex Optimization owner, um, and uh, his prior work experience is with Aptitude and Aspen Tech, and then also with Exxon Mobil. Um, comes from the uh, University of British Columbia, and like Mark, has extensive uh, experience in optimization and control, 35 years of experience, and he's consulted for companies around the world, um, especially in airplane units and other light hydrocarbon units. So welcome, Doug. Well, thank you very much for the welcome. I'd say after all those years of experience, I don't have anything like the experience that Keith Lehman has. Oh, <laughs> very good. Well, we've got uh, Keith on the line, too. Um, not as one of our panelists, but as one of the participants today. So we're glad to have uh, Keith here as well. OK, and then we also have uh, Judson Wooters. Uh, he's at Chevron Phillips um, Chemical, and he's uh, uh, He's a Bachelor of Science from Brigham Young University, uh, and then also his grad studies at Oklahoma State. And he's been extensively involved in the optimization and control at CPCAM, uh, working on a variety of units there related to Olefin's plant. So welcome, Jed. Thank you. OK, great. And then uh, Richard Hughes as well with Sabic UK. Um, and uh, he is a, a process control consultant uh, coming from the University of Bath, and uh, prior experience with Aspen Tech, ICI, and GEC Avionics, and he has 25 years of experience. And and uh, so welcome, Richard, as well. Thanks, John. Uh, I'm also a bit nervous since I was taught the craft by uh, Keith Lehman as well, so uh, I'm glad he's okay. microphone <laughs> <laughs> Very good, and uh, you know the the interesting thing I think with this this panel group here is that we have uh, you know combined um, you know right right around a hundred years of experience uh, between the three the four of you, and uh, so we have definitely a, a breadth of experience uh, with this with this group. So so let me go ahead and just start off by introducing Olefin's production. Um, we're trying to produce uh, these, these olefins, the, the ethylene, propylene, and higher hydrocarbon um, uh, olefins through hydrocarbon cracking. Um, and, and these are at high temperatures, sometimes in the presence of these zeolite catalysts. And um, the interesting thing about uh, you know, olefins production is that in the US and the Middle East, um, it's principally coming from ethane crackers and you know, coming from ethane and propane feedstocks, whereas in Europe and Asia, the feedstock is, is primarily naphtha. Um, and then, um, you know, we'll get into this a little bit more, but, you know, after the, the cracking or the furnace area, uh, these olefins are separated to a very high purity by fractional distillation and then used in a variety of processes 
uh, most mostly polymers um, and, and feedstocks for other um, for other processes as well. Um, and, and the interesting thing about what's happening right now in the U.S. is that uh, you know the ethylene capacity is projected to increase significantly with a number of companies, uh, including Exxon Mobil, uh, Chevron Phillips, Shell, Dow Chemical, Formosa, uh, all. In announcing new crackers in the U.S., uh, which was was uh, not really on the radar. Start muting the microphone. Okay. Um, let's see. So, um, you know, and also Sassel, they're investigating a. Uh, a uh, fairly large cracker at Lake Charles with the gas to liquids, um, you know, making the higher chain hydrocarbons out of the uh, out of the hydraulic fractured uh, gas uh, supply that that uh, hit the U.S. recently. So, with that background, um, you know, we've invited these four panelists to discuss um, some of the opportunities, not only some of the technology opportunities, uh, but also uh, some of the career opportunities. So a number of the, the people who are on the line here uh, are also, you know, grad students or others who are interested in careers in this area. And uh, so we're also going to give a little bit of perspective about somebody who's interested in becoming involved uh, in this area and what they need to do to prepare for career opportunities. And, uh, and and this exciting new phase of expansion um, that, that's taking place. So we're going to talk about some existing challenges and new opportunities, the current state of the art in multivariate control for olefins production, and then also the current state of the art in optimization of olefins production. So those two have typically been split. And then uh, you know, any going forward, how do we, how we do things differently? Um, and then we'll also. You know, briefly touch on this, the difference between naphtha and ethane crackers. You know, ethane crackers are going to be much more common in terms of the new plants coming online with the hydraulic, with the shale gas that's, that's becoming available. And what are the differences between those two? What are the opportunities uh, going forward? Also, getting to propylene and other products with shale gas. You know, the, the ethane cracking, there's no propylene or butadiene products produced. So how do you how do you get to that, and um, you know what what is the process of of getting to the uh, the propylene? Um, okay, so I'm going to actually let me let me have Doug just say a little bit about uh, that uh, just to start off. Um, Doug, you you've done a lot of work in in Europe, uh, the Middle East. You've seen the you know the naphtha and also the ethane cracking. How do we how do we get to the propylene and these other products? Thank you, John. Um, there is a, uh, in terms of propylene, certainly in, in the Middle East, there's a, a, a significant number of gas crackers that have been built. And of course, they run into the same problem of how do you make propylene? Uh, and there is, uh, so, so the process, the metathesis process of uh, converting ethylene and butene to propylene exists, and then the, which, and you make the butene out of ethylene uh, in a dimerization process. So there is a, a direct process to take largely ethylene and go straight to propylene, uh, which, is, which is important. The other route is propane dehydrogenation, uh, which is a, uh, Simple but uh, technically advanced process of, of, uh, of uh, dehydrogenating the protein. That's not me making the noise. Uh, although I'm in a control room. Um, the uh, and propane dehydrogenation. There's a number of propane dehydrogenation units. Uh, I'm certainly seeing one in Spain and uh, one in France. Uh, that just convert propane into propylene uh, through a uh, low pressure catalyst dated uh, uh, cracking reactor. Uh, that is driven entirely on the different the price difference between propane and propylene. Uh, as uh, many of the people here, uh, ethane crackers are, are relatively simple. I think we we'll have a picture that comes up for them. They're they're quite a bit simpler. Uh, the naphtha crackers, which make a wide range of products, uh, ethane crackers, 
is made predominantly uh, ethylene, almost entirely, typically about consuming about 1.2 tons of ethane to make one ton of ethylene. So uh, it's, uh, if you look at the price of ethane, I don't know what the price of ethane is now, but if, if you just work out the numbers from the price of ethane at one point and uh, take 1.2 tons of that and make a ton of ethylene, you can see the economic incentive to do that with ethane. Uh, the other thing I would say is there's not much else in the world you can do with ethane. Um, I'm not aware of any other process. Uh, the, the alternative thing to do with ethane is burn it. Uh, I'm not aware of any other process that uses ethane. So ethane will end up being made into ethylene. Uh, it's the obvious economic choice. And yep, that's enough. Okay, that's great. And, and one of the interesting things about the Doug's experience is he's consulted around the world in both the NAFTA and the ethane crackers, so um, he has a perspective on on uh, the different product uh, pathways for ethane feedstocks. Okay, so um, so we have a, a process overview here. I think um, you know Richard, um, we wanted you to say just a little bit about. Um, on your mic So, um, go ahead and start maybe the uh, feedback issues will uh, alleviate a little bit. Okay, thanks, John. Um, this is a new slide for me. This one wasn't, wasn't in yesterday. Um, <laughs> I guess there's not very much to say um, on this slide. Typically, the seam cracker takes largely any feed you can think of. He's saying, through to very heavy naphtha, gas oil, and produces a wide spectrum of products. So although we often refer to ethylene plants, um, really the, the propylene, benzene, butadiene, particularly for us here in the UK, are sort of key products for us. If you just want to skip forward to the, uh, the main slide. Okay. Um, I, I guess most people on the call are probably pretty familiar with the the, the makeup of the nap, the cracker. Um, really, it's best considered as two parts. The, what they tend to call the hot end of the plant is furnaces, um, which, although they are furnaces, really within the ethylene plant, they're our reactors. And that's the only place we can actually make any money where we convert our feed to a spectrum of high value products. Everything past that is just separation. Um, it's complicated separation. But that's all it is. So really within the separation section, you've got a lot, a lot of opportunity to lose money, to so waste energy and um, degrade your high-value products you've made. Just to walk quickly through the process, so we introduce feed, which diluted with some steam, um, ex expose it to a high temperature for a very short period, um, typically 850 degrees C or I guess for those of you that haven't actually metricated yet, about 1550F. Um, then passes through a series of separation steps. First of all, a quench tower, so we'll knock out water, we'll knock out heavy oil and gasoline components. So the gasoline components are largely a aromatic rich stream in sort of C6 to C9, C10 region. Past that section, compressed to um, a relatively high pressure um, for high efficiency separation. Then there's bottom left of the slide, um, a process gas dryer to take out any residual moisture. Then what looks like a very simple bit of kit, which is actually fairly complicated, will chill that, um, that, that speed down to maybe 165 degrees um, centigrade again, so in old money about minus 265F. And most there, it's just a series of straightforward fraction issue steps. And um, it shows this conventional routine. We'll take the methane off, take the methane off, take the freeze off, take the symphons off. Um, the C2 and C3 chains then will separate the ethylene product from unconverted ethane, which is just fed back into the cycle. Same with the propylene, we'll separate the propylene off from unconverted propane, which is recycled. Um, and apart from that, a couple of converters to get rid of um, 
alkynes or acetylene propadiene. Um, that's about it, John. Is that what you want me to say? Yeah, that's a great overview of uh, the NASA tracker. Uh, thank you. And uh, so let me just go on to uh, the next slide here just to give an overview of the current strategies for optimization and uh, controls as well. Mark, let me have you say, you know, you've had a lot of experience with, um, you know, kind of this uh, MPC area, the, anything from the MPC on down to the con uh, distributed control system, also with some experience in the optimization. But let me have you say just a little bit about the MP M MPC um, and, and what that does. Okay, thanks, John. What I, what I think I'll do is I'll start at the distributed control system, or, or DCS, which serves as the regulatory control layer. So we're talking about PID, PID loops that would be controlling flow or temperature, pressure. And so in that layer, we need to get right. It, it's, not just about, you know, it's not just about installing MPC with whatever we have as a control system. We really need to be thinking about the design and the strategy uh, for those PID loops, including uh, you know issues around loop pairing, and so th those those PID loops need to be uh, considered in, in light of the MPC design, and of course those issues need to be resolved before actually implementing um, model predictive control. So as we when we talk about MPC, we're really talking about um, a two layer. Uh, approach where there's a steady state optimization that basically translates into um, constraint pushing and finding the best feasible uh, operating point, followed by a dynamic uh, control, which is r really determining the, the best dynamic path to that steady state solution. So the design here is really around identifying the manipulated variables, the controlled variables, and disturbance variables for the MPC. Of, of course, many of the controlled variables in the MPC will be related to, to uh, composition, product quality uh, measurements, and, and also constraints, particularly as you know, those, those variables that relate to capacity constraints, because we're often uh, pushing throughput um, in, in these crackers. So the other design element in the MPC is really around the number of controllers. and you know, what's guiding that is really um, primarily constraints, where the constraints are and where are your major handles to alleviate those constraints, but as well as considerations of the interactions. And so what you will often find then, and, and part of this in the past has been driven by processing capability, is that to, to solve the problem, you'd have a, a central steady state optimizer um, that would then be providing set points to individual dynamic controllers that then would uh, determine that best path to the, to the optimum. And so what you, what you might have typically um, in these formulations is individual MPC controllers around the furnaces and then quite large groupings of, uh, of distillation columns in the downstream. So it's quite easy to get into the range of, you know, 50 to 100 manipulated variables and perhaps twice that number of the of the of the controlled variables. So I, I guess with that, I'd, I'd turn it over to Judd to talk about the the uh, the RTO layer. Yeah. So so Judd, why don't you also just mention you know the uh, on the right hand side you know the distributed control system seconds MPC you know every couple minutes it's it's putting in new uh, values and and so could you talk a little bit about the time scales first of all just give uh, you know, us a perspective on on how these all work together. Exactly right. So the, the DCS is going to operate on a, on a seconds or, or faster uh, time scale. Um, many model predictive controllers are going to run on a one or sometimes maybe a, a slightly longer, maybe a two minute uh, time frame. Your RTO is going to be in the hours range, so one or two hours um, or maybe even a little bit longer. And then, and then going up from there, um, I'm, I don't have a lot of, much um, uh, to do with our scheduling and, and planning, a little bit with our planning, with our LP, um, but that does run on the, on the order of maybe um, every week or so. 
Um, so what is involved in the in the planning cycle then? What kind of decisions are you getting down from from the planning folks? So the, the, the planning level is is largely a, a feedstock selection level. So you're you're trying to determine, predict out what what's going to uh, what's the feedstock I want to use in my cracker. Um, that decision is largely made for you in a in that thing cracker. Um, the the cracker I I work on is a is a flexi cracker. Um, so in, in the past, there's been more decisions around that, and even currently, we still have some decision making there. But uh, and what kind um, of feeds do you typically get from you know, is a is a flex feed system. So, what kind of feeds do you typically encounter? Um, well, I, anything from um, from naphtha through um, through ethane. Um, we didn't talk about it earlier, but of course, there are chal challenges with running that wide of a feed slate, um, especially going lighter. But um, we we can make the decision to run any and all of that, and because of the unique set of client constraints that our unit has. Um, a feed slate for our unit may look different than a feed slate for a different unit. Okay, great. And, and so why, you know, the, the real-time optimization, why does it have to be run every couple hours? Why couldn't you run it every couple minutes, um, just like the MPC? Sure. So historically, the reason has been, uh, com there's a couple reasons, right? So one reason historically has been computing power. Um, another reason is that it's a steady-state model. And so, um, there are no dynamics. The the RTO doesn't know how to get from one um, state to another optimum state. Your your MPC layer helps you to to navigate that path, and so um, you you have to kind of wait for the plant to become steady or to arrive at the path the path you wanted to get to, and so um, you allow the MPC time to do that. Okay, excellent. Well, thanks, thanks, Mark and Jed, for the overview of how traditionally we've done the optimization and controls. I think that leads right into, um, you know, right into our next discussion topic. And and for this phase, um, you know, I'll ask some questions, but feel free to jump in as a participant and ask our panelists uh, any questions that you have. Um, I'll, I'll just start going through this. If you want to, if anybody wants to jump in, feel free to do so. Just make sure you unmute your microphone um, off to the right of your name on the on the webinar. Okay, so um, so we have we've talked about these ethane and naphtha crackers, and um, you know we we've got uh, you know an interesting you know the, the, it sounds like they're two different. Um, Kind of challenges associated with either the naphtha and the ethane uh, crackers. Any thoughts from the panelists? Uh, um, I'll, I'll just start with the panelists. Sorry, I didn't catch that. Okay, hold on. I got. I'm going to start muting the microphone. Okay. I'm not using some feedback. Um, okay, so. Um, yeah, we've got some interesting trade-offs between the naphtha and the ethane crackers. Um, you know, how do we do the optimization applications for uh, those crackers? Are there any differences on on the economics that drive the optimization? Uh, this, this is Judd. So, um, on the ethane crack, you, your your largest one of your largest optimization handles is is decided for you on design. Um, so, so you do have some trade-offs you can still make um, between conversion speed rate to to fully utilize your your plant. But um, of course, and then with the NASA cracker, traditionally you have a, a lot more handles you can move, feed types you can bring in, um, different severity rates, et cetera. So, um, you're, it's a lot simpler on the thing cracker. I, I don't know that you're going to ask this yet, but I. I'd be curious to hear other panel members talk about whether an RTO is even uh, useful on a on an ethane cracker. Okay, so um, other panelists, um, any uh, thoughts on that? Is is optimization useful on an ethane uh, cracker? Certainly, there are some ethane crackers, uh, typically ones that crack additionally propane. Uh, some of them add propane as an additional feed. Uh, and that can make um, for some changes. Uh, the key parameterization, the key 
parameters are optimized is furnace conversion, um, which is how hard you crack the uh, ethane, which determines the amount of ethylene in the effluent of the cracking furnace. Uh, that that so it, would you say how it hard depends you crack on it. Uh, yeah, Doug, when you hard. say how hard you crack it, what is what determines how hard you crack something? Is it the temperature or the pressure? The temperature, or yeah. You just run it hotter, and you will crack. Um, you will make more ethylene, uh, but you will be less efficient at converting ethane into ethylene. So you will take more feedstock. So typically, high conversion um, operation is associated with when you have an excess of ethane. Uh, it's frequently in ethane crackers that they often have more ethane than they can deal with uh, because they were built before, after the ethane became available. Uh, and then they can typically run high conversion, so for production maximization purposes. But I do agree that the number of degrees of freedom and handles for ethane crackers is reduced. Um, it, but there are some, and there's certainly some examples of online optimizers typically focused around optimizing the um, the furnace fracking operation. Okay, great. Um, so, you know, we have I've heard a lot about these, you know, the the models that are put into these optimizers, and and uh, the models uh, that that I've heard about they cover the whole plant, you know, the distillation columns, the, you know, the, the cracker, the furnaces, um, the compressors. You know, what, what's the, you know, the, the question is, you know, how much model rigor is necessary to capture these benefits uh, for the optimization? Do you guys have any thoughts on that, on, on the correct level of model rigor uh, to be able to capture those benefits? Richard oh, might be good to comment on that. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Josh. That's a, that's a very, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, on these plants, you know, we're looking at maybe a million tons a year of feed going through these units. And the justification for the optimization is very, very small incremental improvements in, in the optimal yield and, and in energy. And to, to really to really capture that, you need a very accurate model. Um, the question for me is not really just the accuracy of the model, it's the coverage. Um, as Doug said, the bulk of the benefit from these optimizers comes from setting the right furnace temperatures, to so actually getting the optimal yield from the furnaces. Um, so then set some sort of secondary optimizations, um, the, the, the exit pressure, the suction pressure on the main gas machine, there's a significant trade-off between um, the yield pattern and energy. So there's a yield energy trade-off. And then there's some additional energy trade-offs around um, balancing recovery in the back-end columns against the size of the recycles. But to be honest, the biggest um, margins are to be had in the furnaces. So is it better just to have very, very detailed furnace models and simplified back-end models, or full-scope optimizers that cover the whole scope? And also, we've identified on, on some of our processes that the key things you need for an online optimizer is a, an optimum solution that isn't obvious. Um, you also need an optimum solution that changes with time. So you need you know, something different from day to day, different feed prices, different constraint sets. And on some of our units, we found we can actually do the optimization in a linear sense in the control layer and, and do away with the online optimizer itself. But, that, that's on a very case-by-case -case basis. Hmm. So, R Richard, can you can I just ask a follow-up question on that? And, and uh, you know, how much, in, in terms of order of magnitude of benefits, are, are typically standard for putting an optimizer versus not having an optimizer on, on these Olefin plants? I, I think who you ask depends on the, whether you're an optimizer guy or a control guy. I mean, the sort of figures that are banding around are usually about 3 to 5% for the control and 3 to 5% for the optimization. Um, but you hear different, different numbers from different people, and it, it does very much depend on whether you've got a speed limited cracker 
um, or, or whether you're going to fail the limited backer or whether you're truly back end limited. You really do have to look at these things on a case by case basis. So three to five percent for a one point five MTA plant. I mean that sounds that sounds uh, fairly significant. Can you put that in terms of dollars? Or in, in, in your case, in terms of pounds? Yeah, not off the top of my head, but typically these things, you're talking about paybacks of, you know, six months. Okay. So six months payback. Um, and, uh, okay, excellent. Any other perspectives from our other uh, panelists on the benefits from... Uh, you know, including these optimization algorithms or optimization applications um, for the plants. You're asking about the potential other others speaking to the benefits. Yeah, some benefits for the. I, I just I just quick using a three to five percent if it's a one point five kill times a year plan that sort of sounds like approximately two, million, two, two to three million dollars potential benefits if it's a three percent. Just okay. Just top of my head, thinking of, of uh, product product values and whatnot. Okay, great. So a couple million dollars per year of, of benefit from including one of these optimizers. And um, then probably, typically, the Napa cracker has just so many more degrees of freedom between CD type and uh, severity or conversion uh, of the of the crackers than than ethane case. Depends sometimes on feed availability and and uh, other cons and what the physical constraints are. So they they can be more difficult to justify optimizing, although they do exist. Great. So let me get back to just another thing that Richard had mentioned previously, which was you know the level of model rigor, and there are you know state of the art packages such as uh, Spiro and others that are very, uh, they're considered some of the best packages for modeling furnaces. Um, can we use those models in the optimization as well, or are there challenges to that? So any, any thoughts from our panelists on um, the state-of-the-art packages, state-of-the-art modeling uh, platforms that you use, and, and, and what have you found that, that works well um, for your applications? I've been told I'm not allowed to answer this question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I can, I can answer it then. Uh, I guess it's my experience that the important model is the one that everybody's alluding to, is the model of the 100 milliseconds or so that uh, the uh, cracked material spends inside the cracking part of a furnace uh, and what happens during that short time, um, at which uh, largely I would say the, uh, the dominant by a zillion miles is, uh, is the Spyro software, which, as all the owners there will know, can be reasonably expensive. Um, but Spyro is typically the de facto standard for modeling of cracking reactants, and you certainly, if you work in ethylene, a lot of people will use it. Um, on some sites, um, the, the code itself can be reasonably complicated. It uh, calculates, I think, uh, still 128 components in the furnace effluent, and basically integrates the reactant down the tube of the coil. Uh, you do see some customers that won't use the actual code online but will develop um, specific regressions of what comes out of the furnaces uh, using the Spiro model as a source for that, which is legal because it's, they've already licensed it, so don't think of doing it as a method if you don't already own Spiro. Uh, and they do that specifically just to increase execution time uh, so that it's a bit faster. But yeah, the spiral models, the rest of the models for the rest of the plant are typically rigorous models. Um, the two key packages, of course, being synthesized Romeo and uh, Aspen Technologies, whatever they call it now, package. But we, we used to call it Aspen RTO. Okay, excellent. 
Um, well, thanks for that perspective, and, and thanks, Judd, for, uh, you know, Judd had to pass these questions by his legal team as well, so there are certain ones that he cannot answer, and, and uh, appreciate the, uh, those that he can contribute to. Um, so, so this next one, um, you know, we also have to be careful with this one uh, because we don't want to say anything about your company's plans or uh, intended uh, you know, start updates for the plans. We can just rely on the public statement um, with, uh, you know, the, the crackers that have been announced. But um, I just wanted to ask this question. Does it change the optimization if feed maximization is no longer desirable. I mean, what do we what do we optimize in that case if we're not trying to push more product through the olefin plant? So, Judd, is that one that you can't answer, or uh, are you available to answer that one as well? Well, so since since I've been here on this unit, all we've been doing is pushing feed, so I'm not as familiar with the other uh, regimes of optimization, but. Uh, you, you might optimize on on cash costs. Um, you might not. You might be in a region where you you can't maximize the feed through just because of the sheer cost of of uh, processing it. I, I'm trying. I'm, I'm grasping a little bit. <laughs> we, we've been in a good good place for a while in the U.S. Okay. So, um, are there opportunities that you know you mentioned? I think conversion might be uh, one area where you could maximize conversion, utilize the feedstock uh, perhaps better for more ethane to ethylene. Um, you know, are there things that you can do to to have better energy efficiency? Um, you know, those types of anything that's obvious to you working in this area where you see some trade offs there where you could maximize efficiency versus um, Putting more uh, product out the door. Sure, you bet. And we're, we're all, I mean, even with uh, low fuel gas prices that we have, we're always no, nobody wants to leave money on the table. So there are still opportunities. Um, um, you're always looking to try to make sure that you don't have too much air in your furnace, or um, that you're putting the feed to the furnace that's running the most efficiently. One of the jobs that RTO can do is to help provide a a feed rate profile to your furnaces and try to help get the feed in the right furnace. Um, that can, can help you in being more efficient, making the pounds, um, the most pounds you can for the least um, fuel gas in your in your furnace. Um, the, a large traditional handle has been suction pressure, pressure on your uh, charge gas machine. And um, at least right now, because of the low fuel gas Prices. The the answer is more feed. So, uh, and then and the uh, and then low pressure helps with your your selectivity of making more olefins, uh, more ethylene. So right now it's it's drive the suction pressure down as much as you can. But there are things that will always make sense um, around your furnaces and around um, leaking is you know using as little refrigeration as you can to separate your products. Those will always make sense to do. Okay, great. So there, so there are some trade-offs that you know the optimization will still be relevant even if feed maximization is not the objective. Um, okay, and then um, you know we have uh, you know from from Keith, uh, rigorous models are great, but results are very sensitive to the accuracy of feed composition information and instrumentation controls. Okay, and I uh, I think uh, that is a very good um, statement. Um, and uh, and then uh, so let's let's go on to the next uh, the next topic, which is the controls. So we have the optimization that runs every hour, a couple hours, and then you have the controls that then are tasked with implementing those new set points and perhaps moving the plant uh, dynamically to a new to new set points, to new uh, you know, pushing the feed through through different units um, in a way that that considers the trade offs. Throughout the plant, um, so let me let me just start off with this question. Um, you know, how do we how do we split the decisions between the RTO and the MPC? You know, where where do you how do you decide where to make that cut? And maybe I'll open that up to Mark um, just to start off. Well, I think I'll just introduce the topic, John, because I think others would be in a better position to address that. But one of the things you would do would be to have the MPC layer consider the um, basically the throughput maximization, 
um, whereas the RTO layer could then target um, severity and some of these other trade-offs um, uh, that, that were alluded to, to earlier. Okay, great. Any other thoughts from the, the other panelists on, on where to make that split? Okay. Uh, I guess I could I could offer that that is certainly uh, Mark is correct. I uh, there's uh, Mark knows I I guess because I talked to him about it over a glass of wine. Um, that I think that was just one glass. Wasn't the, it, it was a bo one bottle, I think. Um, <laughs> but the uh, uh, down at the uh, APC layer, there are some crackers that have moved control of the overall reaction severity down to the APC layer so that uh, that they can maximize speed to one constraint in the separation section of the plant and then uh, adjust overall average severity on all their furnaces uh, such that they can hit a second constraint, which would normally, you know, one constraint could be in the C2 separation and the second constraint could be in the C3 separation. So by adjusting feed rate and temperature, you could therefore maximize feed in two parts of the plant. And certainly I know of three examples of that in the world. Uh, so that that's perhaps one new direction, but absolutely right. Uh, feed maximization is certainly first. Okay, great. Well, let me let me um, move on to this next question. You know, the with the advances in computing power. I mean, MPC has has been around since the '80s. Is that is that correct? Maybe the uh, the '80s is when you know MPC really started to come into these plants, and and uh, some of the first controllers were deployed. Um, and uh, you know, just the way that was done with the uh, you know the constraints on computing power. A lot of those constraints are are gone now, or, or uh, you know, there's there's definitely an opportunity to potentially expand controllers to be larger and uh, to be less, um, you know, split into separate controllers. Is is the tendency with that new computing power to be more or less centralized, or are we heading toward something where we could have one controller for the the entire plant? Um, and uh, maybe I get Keith to uh, chime in on that as well. Um, any of the panelist members, uh, if you'd like to uh, address that one. Mark, what's been your experience with the size of controllers? Well, I think my, my, my experience is, is, is maybe not as recent, um, and so I'm kind of curious of, uh, um, of, of those experiences with, with those here lately. You know, um, I was referring earlier to the to, to the approach where you did have to distribute the, the dynamic controllers and then coordinate with a central steady state. So certainly with with processors getting faster, then you, you have, uh, you know, those opportunities. I don't know to the extent that we've, we've really seen that, so I'd be curious of the input from, from others there. I, okay, great. Richard? John, I think in the early days of applying this to ethylene plants, th there was very much a standard template that was applied across and every ethylene unit, which consisted of you know individual controllers on individual plant sections, a composite linear program, and then potentially a um, an RT opt. Uh, as we've sort of talked a bit now, I think that there's a lot more now that each job is looked at individually on its own merits. Um, the example we talked about before about RTO or um, MPC layer decisions. To me, it comes down to can you make the necessary um, can you define the solution you're looking for in the MPC layer? You know, is it a linear or linear enough um, problem that you can actually solve? By that, I mean, um, typically a, a, a coil outlet temperature optimization on a furnace will have a turning point in it, so the sign of the game will change, and the solution you're looking for doesn't lie at one of the In that case, you're forced to put it into the RTO layer, because you can't solve that using a linear program. Um, you can get other problems that are e equally nonlinear, but there's no sign change in the gain, and, th and the solution lies at the intersection of the Then you can solve it with the, uh, with the DMC layer with the, or, or, or any model-based predictive control package. So I think those are the sort of decisions you made about whether to use RTO or not. I think the same sort of decision 
about centralised or decentralised. The things that probably limited us in the past, as you say, were CPU power, and also just the ability to handle the models and the data with the tools that we had. Now, it, those, those aren't really restrictions for us, so it's pretty much free choice to build a single controller or, or build segregated controllers. And there are advantages and disadvantages to both. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you, Richard. Keith has his hand um, you know, indicated that he wants to make a comment. Keith, I've unmuted your microphone. If, if you want to see if that would uh, uh, it will work, if you want to make a comment as well. Sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to add on to, uh, to what Richard was saying um, uh, about the, certainly we used to be limited by, by computer horsepower. Um, I'd say now that, that wouldn't limit me from building one DMC controller for the entire Olsen plant, but, but uh, main, maintenance of the controller is, is probably now what, I, what I'm considering to be the constraint. So with everything being in one giant model, it makes it really hard to maintain and update parts of it and retest parts of it. Um, so I, it, it would be, uh, be really nice that on my, my DMC wish list forever, um, to be able to have uh, uh, one big controller, but have the, the models be able to be loaded and uh, like modules to have uh, be able to update sub models and and um, having to update the thing. But, but I think maintenance and, and uh, being able to um, to maintain the thing long term is is got to be a consideration too. Okay, well that leads perfectly, Keith, into our next uh, point, which is you know state of the art for plant testing. You already obtained these models and model development. You know, where are the opportunities and uh, where are we going with that? Any thoughts on that? Yes, since I was already talking, I can. I've got a, a couple of quick things to say about that. So um, certainly, uh, you know, I you know I. Tend to uh, to use mostly the, the Aspen technology, um, so that's where you know, I can speak from. Um, there's certainly developments going on, and I think trying still to make testing uh, more kind of accessible to the uh, I guess non-expert, you know, those of us that, that people other than those of us who've been doing this for 20 years. Um, I think uh, one of the things that, that Aspen's come out with now is a, a uh, kind of an extension of, of Smart Step, which is automated testing, but it's, um, they call it, I think, calibrate mode. So it's um, intended to, to do um, overlay some steps uh, on top of control, and it's supposed to be less uh, you know, disruptive to the process. I think that's, a, that's something that, that is uh, where where things are headed to, to where the local site control engineers are able to do more of this testing without having to use uh, you know internal or external experts. As far as modeling goes, I know one of the biggest uh, the the big improvements that I'm waiting to be able to use is constrained model identification. Um, so uh, and, and I think this is also coming in future uh, or in, in in Aspen software. Uh, to be able to impose some constraints on at the model ID uh, uh, phase, so you can end up with a, a model that's, that's already kind of tuned to do what you want. And so I end up spending a lot of time after model identification and tweaking gains and conditioning uh, sub matrices to make sure that I get the right closed loop response. Um, okay. So that's, those are things I think that'll help us uh, speed up implementation down the road. Great. And, and so, Mark, you know, you've also had some experience with, you know, in, in research um, in this area, designing the step tests uh, in an optimization framework. Can you say, are any of those things that you're working on going to be able to help Keith with what he's he's asking for? <laughs> um, uh, possibly. I think from from the on the uh, on the research side. Um, what you'd really want to be able to do is solve it as a true optimization problem, um, where you would basically set the the constraints on your on your manipulated variables and constraints on your outputs or your controlled variables um, 
you know, based on your latest model. Um, there really hasn't been a lot of, of progress on, on the academic side uh, to, to speak of. Uh, as you mentioned, John, that's an area I, I've been looking at. Um, what, what I think you want to be able to do eventually is, is, is actually be able to target uh, portions of the overall model that have the, um, you know, the least uh, accuracy or the poorest quality and be able to really adapt your design to, to focus sp specifically on, on, on those. Um, so I, I, I continue to see this as, as an opportunity area. Um, we, we might just step back a bit and, and mention that we, we still find a range of, of testing approaches used in practice today. We, we still find manual step testing. We find uh, uh, automatic testing done in open loop. And then increasingly, especially over the past few years, are, are more techniques that would work uh, in closed loop, either sort of in a, in a, in a passive mode where you're primarily uh, conducting the step test and the controllers there to keep you when you go outside your limits to uh, some of these uh, techniques that, that Keith uh, mentioned where, you, where you're actually you know superimposing a step test uh, on, a, on a functioning controller so more of a kind of a joint uh, ob objective. Okay, but great. I, I, I would say that there, there is still some different opinions on whether and to the extent that automatic testing should be used. So uh, I think that's still a, a discussion point. Yeah, and I, I've definitely heard that, that some are even going back to regular step tests, open loop step tests, um, because of the um, intuition that it might give. And, and um, But definitely there's, uh, there's you know, that whole range of, of doing uh, step tests. So. Um, let me. And I know we only have a few minutes left. I just want to get to um, you know, maybe to this very last point. Um, you know, what are career opportunities in this area? Um, you know, how can somebody that has listened to this uh, presentation today and said, "Wow, these are some really interesting problems. I want to get involved in this area, either as an undergraduate student or as a graduate student." What kind of things led you uh, to this career? And um, you know how can how can they start preparing now for some of these challenges? So, Jeff, let me since you're the most recent uh, graduate, let me have you uh, talk uh, first, and then we'll try to get the other panels uh, to chime in as well on this. Sure. So, um, I for me at least, it started in the uh, undergrad uh, process control class at BYU. Um, I was one of I was probably one out of sixty that thought the class was fun. Um, at least that was uh, my perception. Um, I had zero interest in going to grad school, but I, I felt like um, if I wanted to, if that's what I wanted to do, and it seemed like the advice was that if I wanted to get into it immediately, I'd go to grad school. So that was the uh, <clears throat> that was the, the, the path that I chose. So I went to grad school and then um, immediately was able to do an internship uh, at Chevron Phillips, and that's where I've been since. Um, I don't know that that's the path that's needed to be followed any, anymore. I, I think right now in, in the industry, um, there's a lot of need for um, younger engineers interested in doing it. I don't know that you need to invest the time in grad school necessarily, although I I would never, never regret it, and I, I think it's only helped me. Um, I think we're finding, though, that there's enough of a need that uh, if you are driven and want to do it, that if you make that known to your employer, um, quickly after starting, I think they'll help you find a way to get into it. Okay, great. Doug, let me, uh, you, you have, yeah, go ahead and, and uh, is it Richard? It is, yeah. I've, I'm in the position where I've been trying to recruit decent control engineers in this area for about two years. Um, most of us in this industry are getting fairly old now, some of us older than others, um, and people are hard to come by. And one of the things that I've observed over the years is that the, um, the software vendors are doing all they can to actually take the expertise, the details of running the codes and knowing how to use their packages. That's the sort of things they're automating with the, um, you know, the, the, the smart step with the model quality checks. They're, they're putting lots of tools in for you there. And the key for me is a good process engineer 
who can understand processes, see where the constraints are, see what the opportunities are. So I think the skill in this area really is around being a good process engineer. Excellent. Well, great perspective there. Doug, any thoughts from you on this? Uh, I certainly agree with with, um, with Richard uh, that, it, that there is a, a shortage of young people that want to get into this industry. I find it really interesting. I love control rooms. I love traveling and seeing these units. And there's been a huge amount of fun uh, meeting all your all the people. That one I would say is I will would agree with Keith's, uh, Keith's point that he, he typed out of there that the world is full of these units and similar that need good quality people working on. And, and the final young Doug, you're kind of chopping in and out there. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. Is this okay? Uh, yeah. the, the the third thing I would say is that uh, in my day, you started off working for a big company like Exxon, and then once you figured out everything about what to do, you would uh, then go out and work for a vendor uh, and go around showing all the stuff you learned in the Exxon world. Um, nowadays, that's exactly the opposite. Um, the young people are typically joining the vendors, uh, and they work for five or six years, and then they go to the big companies so they don't have to travel so much. Um, so uh, as to how you get started in this business, I guess it's either way. But I think it's a fantastic career, and I don't think anybody that gets involved with it would ever be short of work. Excellent. And, Mark, uh, you've obviously chosen to go back and get a Ph.D. Um, you know, after some years of experience in industry. Um, is uh, you, know, you need a PhD to be successful in this area? No, 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 a absolutely not. You just got to be wired a little bit differently, I guess, to inflict that on yourself. But uh, I think I echo some of the earlier comments about uh, you know the the interest and, and focus on the process. And I think maybe the other thing to mention is. You know, there is a lot of shifting through positions within a company. Um, I really do think in, in the control area specifically, we, we, we need to have more people really focused on that as their career with, uh, you know, with the attendant specialization that I think the, uh, that, that area needs. Okay, fantastic. Well, um, it looks like we're about out of time right now. Um, you know, if there's any burning questions that any of the participants have, I'll, I'll go ahead and open it up to any last one or two questions uh, from the group. Um, so any any questions? Make sure you unmute your microphone if you're going to ask. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask a question. This is Jose Mojica here at BYU, uh, working under uh, Dr. Hemingren, and I worked last summer at uh, Exxon Mobil at the Olefins plant. And uh, one of the things that I saw um, is that, you know, we were talking about optimization and advanced controls, and uh, many times the engineers, the operators don't tr trust the, you know, what we're telling them that they should trust. And, uh, you know, they end up disconnecting the DNC or, or the RTO because they're just, uh, they're, I don't know, they don't trust it. They don't trust what they're saying. How? Uh, how do we help them, you know, maybe correct that? Because, I mean, basically we, we, we're spending all this time trying to do these big things and fancy things, but they just don't want to use it. So so maybe I could speak to that a little bit. I, I don't remember who it was. Maybe Doug said um, getting, getting to meet people, getting to know people. My experience, at least, has been um, um, getting to know, getting to know and, and helping Helping operations operators trust you um, through other other means, through conversation, through uh, getting to know them, uh, buying them donuts. But um, I, I I think I think it comes with building the relationship. In my experience. Okay. Okay, great. And uh, any other thoughts from the panelists? 
Okay. Any other questions from the uh, the audience? You're welcome to to ask. Okay. Well, fantastic. Well, thanks uh, everybody for joining, and uh, we'll thank our panelists as well. Um, you know, uh, Judd and Doug and Richard and Mark. Um, you know, both all all of them with extensive experience in this area, uh, both the optimization and the control as well. And um, you know, with perspective on you know these, these exciting challenges that you know with the ethylene expansion within the U.S. and uh, you know how that's going to affect things and, and opportunities for for young engineers or for those who are professionals interested in getting in uh, to this area. So thank you so much um, for for joining us and for sharing some of your experience with us uh, today. So. Um, all right. Well, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll go ahead and conclude now. And well, thanks uh, very much. It's, uh, it's been a delight to hear from you and to uh, and to hear some of the comments and questions. It's been really enjoyable. Okay. Great. Thanks, Doug. Okay. And thanks everybody for jumping on. I appreciate it.